Hey everybody. A few years back when I was preparing the Soul Pancake book, I did a number of interviews with some great writers and thinkers and artists about life's big questions, about the profound topics that we wanted to tackle in the book. And one of those people was the late Harold Ramis. We got to speak about all kinds of different topics, life, death, the afterlife, meaning, the Dalai Lama, farts. It was really great to unearth our interview and edit it together for you guys. It's a conversation I really enjoyed and I hope that you will too. This is for the late, great Harold Ramis. My overt or covert uh, message is always the, this, the synthesis of Buddhism, Judaism, existentialism, and psychology. Do you think yeah. you can do any of that with me here today? Uh, I have no choice. It's, uh, I'm compulsively self-revealing. Oh my God. So Harold Ramis, let me lead off with this. What is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? Man, uh, I, I always go from uh, a, a, a little book. I like, I like little books because I, I, they don't take that much time to read. There's one called uh, Man's Search for Meaning. Yeah, you know Victor that? Frankl. Victor Frankl. All right, so I thought that was a very impressive book. Uh, and you know what I came away with? He, he's to me, he's a, like a happy existentialist that life has no inherent meaning, which um, you know is a bleak prospect for a lot of people. But it's it's completely consistent with uh, for me with not just with existential psychology, which I kind of subscribe to, but uh, it's also a, a deeply held Buddhist principle that uh, that we create meaning. That it's up to us to create meaning. As children, we start out, you know, just looking for pleasure and fun. Later, we convert that into we want power, money, fame, you know, success, uh, control over our lives. Those are maybe true, but once you're done with that, the, the, all you have left is meaning. So then you're driven by a will to meaning. And almost anyone who's uh, achieved uh, maybe a fair measure of their original goals is usually left with that feeling of either despair, is that all there is, you know, I thought these things would make me happy, but they haven't, or uh, a feeling of uh, discovery, like, you know, the beginning of at least a glimpse of the wisdom that says uh, that there's much more to life, and, and, and it comes from a deep understanding of life, and, you know, responsibility, and identity, consciousness, all those things, meaning, the things that comprise meaning. For me, I found this kind of a, a renewed search for meaning happened once I had achieved what I really set out to do, which was all of a sudden in my mid late 20s, I was a working actor and I was getting paid and I wasn't making very much money, but you know, my career was on track and I was, I was doing what I had always wanted to do. And yet I thought that was it. And I got there and I felt hollow. I felt barren. I, I felt like I needed something more. Yeah, I think most people feel that. Most people, a lot of people are, 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 are deprived of that, uh, that, that awareness because they, they never get where they think they want to be. So they, they, bec they, they remain kind of mired in that, in that search for what they think will make them happy. Right. The lucky ones get what they think they wanted and then find out, oh, you know, there is no end. There's, there, it, that it, it is, it's in fact a, a constant seeking that, that never ends. You'll never get what you need because uh, it doesn't, it's not possible. And it's a process and understanding that you're engaged in this process, like it or not, for the rest of your life and there's no destination and there's no ending where you say, okay, I'm done. You know, mm -hmm. you don't say that till your last breath, I guess. Mm -hmm. You know, your mortality is not in doubt. That's gonna ha that's gonna happen, and whether you're here or outside or doing anything, you have the same fundamental uh, need or responsibility to to make this day meaningful, whatever it is, even if you're in hell. You know? mm. So, you said before that you had uh, spoken before you were going to be speaking on humor as a survival tool for the for the Jewish culture. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, this is my construct. You can, you can see the world as tragedy. You know, this, this fatal flaw makes life, you know, unbearably poignant, sad, and tragic. Or you can see it as comedy, that there's an inherent irony in, in virtually everything in the world. 
But I guess for me, you know, uh, seeing it as, as humor and attacking it with humor was my own defense against it, you know. It doesn't hurt me because I see it, I can joke about it, I can diffuse tension by making people laugh about it. Uh, and uh, for me, that's the defense mechanism that comes with this uh, absurd awareness. I've heard recently that the fart is the most universal humor. It's in every culture of the world. At any age, virtually, you know. It's like, yeah, but it's, it's in funny. every, even Eskimos, they have 50 <laughs> yeah. words for fart. <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, I don't know. I think, I think, I, I don't want to press this, and I've never, but let's just take the fart as, as a metaphor for, for our vulnerability, that the accidental revelation of our humanity, you know? Uh, it cuts Which through. I accidentally reveal about 40 times a day. <laughs> yeah, well, it cuts through any pretension we have, or uh, all social classes, all, all our intellectual, any intellectual overlay we have. It just cuts through everything, and, and that's what good comedy always does, I think, is it, 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 it bypasses the intellect and a, and a, and a rational process and, and, and touches us where we're most human somehow. Mm -hmm. And, and it, and it's a reflex. It's a in the diaphragm. You know, it's just it's like an instinct, like fear. It's oh, that's funny. Um, how are you spiritual without believing in God, per se? I don't deny that. You know, we live in a miraculous world. There's no question, it, and it's driven by forces we we may never understand. You know, uh, and that's you know, it's awesome. It's mysterious. It's. Uh, but um, I don't. I don't give it a name. I don't pretend to understand it, or, or accept that other human beings know the rules, or that there's some moral code that derives from it that other people know that I don't. I have no problem with, uh, with God. It's just not making God an entity is not an important thing for me. Um, and real quick, we'll just finish up by let me ask about your history with the Dalai Lama, your yeah. experiences with him and uh, what you've taken away from your interactions with him. Oh, hold on one sec. Yeah. Here he comes. Hey. Say hi to Rain. Hi. hi Rain. How are hi, you? Hi, Dolly. Bless you. <laughs> Bless, that's me and my wife uh, and the Dalai Lama at our first meeting. Awesome. At the uh, at the Four Seasons in Washington, <laughs> makes total sense. He had a great room, you know, and uh, you know it's just what you'd expect. Uh, uh, he had no agenda, just humorous, patient, and ready to answer anything. Uh, and, and my wife asked him a good question. She had spent the previous day at the Holocaust Museum, and his speech had been about unbiased compassion. He, he, the big public speech. He said it's easy to have compassion for our relatives, for our friends, for our kinsmen, for our countrymen, you know. But how do you have compassion for the other? We spend a lot of time demonizing the other. How do you have compassion for those people? So she'd come from the Holocaust Museum and she said, I, you know, I understand what you're saying, but how do I find compassion for, for the monsters in the world, the torturers, the Hitlers, you know, and, uh, and he said, well, he said in a theistic tradition, you know, uh, people believe in, in, in a, a divine retribution that they get theirs in, a, in, another, in an afterlife of some kind that, that they will be punished. He said in Buddhism uh, we assume that everyone is a suffering being. If they're not now suffering they will eventually they have, all, they have suffered or will suffer. He said imagine that you're, uh, you see a child running uh, and he's running toward a cliff. And he's too far away he can't hear you yell to warn him and he's too far away for you to stop him you see him run off the cliff he falls he's seriously injured he said you you have to have compassion for that child without even knowing him he said now imagine you see another child running toward the same cliff same situation having seen the first one you you have compassion for this child before he even falls because you know he you know inevitably he will fall and suffer right he said, that's the world. Everyone is running toward that same cliff of suffering, you know. You look like the Judah. <laughs> I'm feeling that way. J-E-W-D-D-H-A? No. Yeah. 
Yeah.